cool we're live hey everybody welcome to the bone town podcast this is Razo right here and today's guest i have is matthew hartnett does uh, cor- uh, say it right hartnett yeah 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 okay yeah, cool, cool. Right. let's see let's see if i can get this yeah baby dun, dun. We'll get something real quick making sure i got all my levels good yeah thanks for joining me man i've been i you know i've been following you for a while now and uh i've been really i've been digging your sound i've been digging what you've been doing the gumbo jam uh, sundays Uh you were doing it uh at uh big top correct yeah yeah at the big top lounge right there next to the alley cat nice man and how, how long have you been doing that um so so you started the gumbo jam 2015 mm-hmm. in new york um yeah 2015 started the gumbo jam um was it 2014 oh, i want to say 2015 i want to mess, mess it up maybe 2014 i don't know but i think 2015 but um yeah man started in new york um i was at a place like um like I was trying to like break the glass ceiling, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like um like in the game sometimes like you'll come up, you'll come up, you'll come up, and then you'll get to a spot where you're like I don't know, like I was at that place to where every single year, year in and year out, I'm watching all my friends, all these guys that I play with on a regular weekly basis, they're at the Grammys, they're on MTV, they're not I'm just like, bro, like these are my peers. These are not just like people I I know. Mm-hmm. These are people I play with. Like, I work with them every day. And I'm like, bro, like, come on, man, what's going on? And so, in just an effort to break the glass ceiling, man, I was just like, I'm going to just do something different. And, um, you know, I was uh, I was married at the time or whatever, and we kind of brainstormed. And she was like, yo, you should take, like, the thing that you do with, like, the horn section, like, live. and Because that's what I was known for. It's like the horn section leader. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Walking to any place, whatever horns are there. You're gonna have a popping horn section because I'm good, like in the moment. So it was like, all right, well, create that somehow on a larger scale. So I was like, all right, well, we'll just do it with like a whole band, and we'll add singers and we'll add, you know, hip hop artists and all the types of stuff like that. And um, and I had actually been training for this all this time. I was in New York because I worked for Cheryl Pepper Raleigh doing the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. Um, did the same exact thing at the lesson, uh, the hip hop session in New York. Um, now they're like they're in LA, they're like big and touring and stuff like that, you know. But we did the same thing at all these major sessions, and I was just like, man, okay, cool. So now I just did my own, yeah. and uh, had one in Manhattan, had one in Brooklyn, um, achieved a lot of success, had a lot of people come, come through. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that dude, uh, uh, Safari from Love Pop. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking. About? You know the guy. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever. Uh, what was his name again? One more time. Safari. It sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he, he he's a, a big figure in on love and hip hop, bro. But he not he he came through a few times in a, at the Brooklyn session. Nice. Hog the mic up and all that shit. But you know, but it was just cool. It was good exposure and stuff like that. And then transitioning to Houston, I wanted to start one here. Mm-hmm. So at one point there was like gumbo. NYC, there was a gumbo Brooklyn, there was a gumbo Houston, mm-hmm. um, but eventually it's it's hard to it's hard to maintain continuity and like quality when you're not there to actually do it. Mm-hmm. So I just eventually shut all the New York stuff down and just focus my attention on the Houston one. Yeah, so uh, that's cool, man. Yeah, because you know, there's so much really cool and awesome musicians in Houston, and it just and Houston's so big, but it's just like no one really mm-hmm. knows about it. It's like you really have to dig deep, and there's so much talent yeah. here, and and that's cool that you were able to bring something like you know from that originated in New York to Houston, and stuff like that. And yeah. that's that's super badass because I mean I feel like we need more of that. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and and I think and this is one reason why I started this podcast too is you know because there's so many badass musicians that people don't know about. And that are from Houston, moved to Houston, grew up here and you know, whatnot. And it's just, you know, there's so much going on. And, you know, I'm hoping to bring that attention, you know, to it. Um, yeah. Uh, what you might call it. Oh, yeah. Um, 
So, and then I also heard that you were cooking gumbo and serving it at the at these. Oh know? yeah, man. So that's yeah, that's that's a whole part of the thing. So, the gumbo jam is um, an entire like all encompassing cultural experience. So you got the social gumbo. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the the piece where we're coming from all different walks of life or whatever. We're just mixing it all in. Yeah. Um, you know, we're just building community. Then you have the music gumbo. You know, we have mad different instruments, um, different artistic mediums, and we figure out how to make it work in the moment. That's literally gumbo. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then you have the the food. You got literal food, gumbo that you can eat. Um, I had that gumbo business. I started that gumbo business at the same time I started the session. Nice. So I had it in New York. Um, and I was really just wholesaling. I was just wholesaling the different restaurants. It was cool to have my name on the restaurant menu. Nice. You know what I mean? <laughs> but um so yeah, like it was like a big deal. I'm like, yo, I'm on a New York restaurant, man. It's crazy. <laughs> but um, so and then uh, yeah, so I just continued that same thing down here um, in Houston. So you know, yeah, you can, you can get gumbo in your stomach, in your ears, all over your body. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, so uh, you did you grow up here in Houston? Yeah, I, I grew up here in Houston, man. Grew nice. up on the north side. Went to Eisenhower. Um, play football, was in band, you know, the whole the whole high school thing, yeah. you know. And and you went to uh, TSU as well? Yeah, Texas yeah. Southern University. Nice. Yeah, I, I credit TSU for, for everything because I didn't, um, I mean, I was a classical major going into college, mm -hmm. midway through college. I think I switched. Um, I mean, because I was coming into college, uh, you know, for my, my trombone heads out there. Uh, <laughs> I played Bluebells of Scotland my junior year in high school for a solo and ensemble. Um, you know, I was doing uh, Remsey Korsakoff, I think, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that uh, in high school. So when I got to college and then at Texas Southern University, like it wasn't a big classical school. So, I mean, I was heading tails over everybody yeah. as far as classical music was concerned. Um, I had a friend of mine. Actually, no, it wasn't a friend of mine. It was like one of my professors introduced me to somebody from the Houston Symphony. Mm -hmm. And um, they were like, hey, man, you know, I think it was my sophomore, junior year, but not sophomore year. And they were like, hey, man, you know, you should um, audition. And it's like, if, if not for nothing else, just get the experience, whatever. Yeah. But um, at, at that point, like my freshman year in college, I, I just learned jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, I played in jazz band in high school, but I just really learned what jazz was like for real when I got to TSU. And it's such a, a freaking like incredible history of uh, jazz music um, at Texas Southern University. Like, I mean, you got the whole entire Crusaders yeah. lineup, you know what I'm saying? From the Wayne Hendersons to the Joe Samples, um, Billy Harper, Andre Haywood, you know what I'm saying? Frank Lacey. Yeah. Um, man, what's my man name? Um, Played, he led the Duke Ellington um, Orchestra for a long time. Um, trumpet player. Ah, man, but I, I forget. I forget. It, it's, so, it's so many. But basically, like, if anybody great in jazz from Houston, mm -hmm. and there's so many, like, they all went through TSU. TSU was, like, the conduit, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I was just, like, standing in the, uh, in the shadow and on the shoulders of so many giants before me. I was just like, man, this is crazy. And once I really discovered jazz, I was like, man, this is really the highest art form. Like, why why have they been lying to me telling me that classical music was like <laughs> the the upper echelon of them all? It's yeah. not, bro. I was like, jazz, I was like, nah, bro. If you can do this, then, <laughs> then you really the shit, bro. Like, yeah, for real. Nah. So now I, I, learned, I learned jazz, man, and that was it, bro. I started getting gigs, and I, I was like, man, forget classical music, bro. Yeah. I, I, mean, yeah. I mean, I can listen to classical now, but it, uh, like growing up, you know, it wasn't to me. It just you know, it was it wasn't it, to me. It was boring when, when I was a kid. You know, now I you know you grow up and you kind of you know you mature and you you appreciate it more for sure. And that's how I am right now with with jazz as well. I mean, I I listened to it and I was just like, yeah, it's cool. But now it's like you know I'm really listening and I'm like, holy shit! Like how's how's he doing this? You know and and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's awesome, man. I, I'm definitely grown to appreciate it more and more every every time I get older, for sure. And, yeah. But yeah, man, TSU is is uh, is is 
I feel like they're it's underappreciated for sure. Like that that school is so yeah, awesome. that's yeah, that's really crazy. Like that's crazy to hear you say that now because like the jazz department is not what it used to be because Prof Harris is not like you know running the jazz department no more like that. You know, mm-hmm. so I, it was really crazy. I guess because I was a part of I guess like the last great wave at TSU um, because I'm gonna, when I moved back from New York and like, you know, and Cass would be like, I would talk about Texas Southern University and and, and if anyone had anything derogatory to say, I was just like, what? Like, what planet have you lived on, bro? Like, yeah. because I, it just wasn't, that, that just wasn't the, the reality when I was there. You know, I mean, like literally when I was there, bro, I took people all the time. Like anybody that's like dope in Houston right now, like that's running the shit in Houston. Yeah. We were all at the TSU at the same time, bro. Like every all the church MDs, um, like we would go to jazz festivals, right? Mm-hmm. And like we would pack the room out because like just the people that were on in our band, yeah. they were all freaking famous, bro. Like we had cast that had Grammys that were in school. Yeah. Like, right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so there yeah. was like one point in time there was there was Luke Austin, Grammy Award winning producer, produced R. Kelly's uh earlier albums, like be at LA Reed's house, like you know what I'm saying, that guy. The, um we had Luke Austin, we had Terrence Vaughn, multiple Grammys. Um we got we had Nick Baker, we had Nick Manack, we had Eric Elder, we had um Chucky was playing drums, um Jerron Thomas, myself, Andre Grant. Marion Ross, um, Buddha on trumpet, um, Brent Neighbors on saxophone, um, Nicoya Polar was a vocalist, um, Lanier was a vocalist, um, Marion, who was like the queen of Houston right now, was a vocalist, uh, Silas Latoisson was there, um, Tabitha Miles, uh, John Fontenot, Eddie Moore, um, Man, and if I, I'm, it was like we were literally all there at the same time, bro. Yeah. So like all of those names, like we had three different small ensembles. Yeah. Um, and they were all Jordan Donald, Jose Laredo, um, and like we had three different like small combos mm-hmm. that were all killing. It was like combo A, B, and C, and it wasn't even like it wasn't even like one was necessarily better than the other. It was just like. We were all just all, our combos were all different. So I led one combo. I think um, Jordan led another one. Um, and then there was another, then we had the Latin jazz. I forget about that, man. <laughs> Probably my body sparks, but um, Professor Sparks uh, had Manira in there. Adrian was playing. Man, I, man, bro, it was so, it was so much. You know what I mean? And yeah. so we would go to contest. And like Cass would just show up and be like, "Oh my God, these guys are like gods, right?" Yeah. And, um, I never forget one time in this contest, um, I was going to play the song called Daoud, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Daoud is like it's a real heavy swing tune, and we was playing in breakneck tempo. We was playing it like that, Dang. and um. <laughs> Yeah, man. And I, I forgot, Lucius Hoskins was there. Also, multiple Grammy. <laughs> uh, Peanut, because these guys were in my ensemble. So, like, Lucius Peanut. Um, and then, so, our bass player got stuck in Houston. Nick Baker, this cat played bass. Now, granted, but we're playing this hard song. We've been practicing all semester on this joint. Nick Baker comes in the day of contest. He doesn't know, doesn't know the song for nothing. He's playing electric bass. Lucius was like, yo, I got you. And I was just like, bro, y'all sure? Like, y'all sure, sure. And I was like, all right, because this is you the bass player, bro. Like, you know. Yeah. And so so Lucius like, I'm like, uh, 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 He's shouting out the chord change. The entire song. Now, we're performing this for a contest, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's learning the song on the stage as someone's yelling the changes to him, bro. And it was probably the best we've I've ever heard that song sound. It was, I was like, what the hell is, I had to stop and look back 
one time because I was like, yo, this is killing him. I can't play it. <laughs> Man, that, and that same day, um, this dude named, this dude, I remember this young kid, this trombone player, he was like, man, yo, how did you do X, Y, Z? And I was like, bro, he had so many questions I didn't know my answers to. And I was just like, bro, um, all I could tell you is that the whole song was in E flat. And that's it. And um, long like long story short, I ended up meeting the kid. Um, I went to the new school in New York. Mm-hmm. The dude's name was Cameron uh, Whalen. And so Cam was like, Cam, I, I met Cam at, at, uh, at the new school. And he was like, man, you don't remember me? And I was like, no, nah, bro, I'm sorry, man. And he was like, man, I met you at the North Texas Jazz Festival. And I was like, for real? And he was like, yo, I was asking you all these questions. And I was like, yo, that was you? <laughs> That's crazy. And so, you know, you know, think about the Whalen family. You got Cameron, Kenneth, Kirk, Whalen, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So Kenneth was um, the guy that's, that's um, the saxophonist, did all the Jay-Z stuff, all the Maxwell stuff. And Cam has been on tour with Bruno Mars since Bruno started, you know, using the full band, bro. So, like, Cam is in his own right. Yeah. His own star and celebrity, bro. Like, he out there in Memphis right now. But Damn. but that's that's really crazy. I was just like, bro, because I met him at the jazz festival when he was, like, a high school kid or something, man. Damn, that's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's super crazy. Yeah. Super crazy. I'm like, bro, hey, you miss a Bruno gig, man? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Let you know. Put me on. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, uh, so when you moved to uh, to New York, um, what 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 took you over there besides like the music scene and everything? That was it, bro. That was it. I, um, I was in Houston, and uh, my man Luke. Um, you know, I don't know. I guess I could talk about it now or whatever. But it was like the Destiny's Child um, reunion tour was supposed to be a thing, right? Mm-hmm. And um. It was supposed to happen by a certain date, and I told myself, well, like, you know, if this doesn't happen, I'm going to go just find somewhere where things are happening. Because I was sitting around in Houston, literally waiting for, like, Jill Scott to come to town and be like, hey, I want to go hear some music and just show up where she at and play. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. But no one comes to Houston for that, though. No. And it's Houston's not even that kind of place. So, like, when artists are in town and they come here, I know this now because I've been in the industry. They're they not coming to, to Houston and going out and being like, let me go check out this last spot because it's uber famous. No. When they're in New York, yeah, they're doing it. When they're in LA, yes. When they're in Atlanta, yes. Even Miami, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or Kansas City. But um, they're not doing that shit in Houston, though, because we're, we're, not, we're not on the map like that artistically, mm-hmm. like locally. Yeah. We, we're, we're everywhere in the industry. If you say you're from Houston, anywhere in the industry, you're both. Mm-hmm. But it's not like being here locally, it ain't like a thing. So yeah. I was just like, damn, man. I remember I remember Jill Scott had like a, she did like a, a listening party here in Houston. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, yo, this is my moment. This is my opportunity. Man, my fucking car broke down, bro. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was just like, fuck this. I'm going to New York. I was like, I'm just like, I'm done. I'm out. I'm leaving. Yeah. Like, and you know, new things were closing down. This was like, Right when um you know we had the uh, when's the last time the, the Wall Street um thing um like the market crash like, yeah that was like oh seven yeah something like, was, yeah, something that, like that yeah it took a while for it to reach down to the to for that thing to trickle down to the music community mm-hmm. but eventually it did so you know close clubs start closing yeah um I remember being like 19, 20 years old making like more money than i make right now in houston mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying working at a club three nights a week doing three services a, uh, a week at a church you know i was killing it man i'm like 19 20 i ain't got no bills bro like yeah. not, 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 not <laughs> so but uh, i mean that shit dried up though so yeah. it was just hard uh, after that and i was like i have to go go get it because this is what you know this is what i do for a living and this is what i want to continue doing i want to do it at the highest level yeah. so move to new york bro I ain't know nobody. I didn't have no friends, no connections, no nothing. Damn. I was just like, hey, I can go to new school and kind of figure things out and transition from there. Yeah, and start connecting and, and whatnot. That's all awesome, yeah. man. Yeah, New York is, is definitely, it's it's not my pace. I'm, I'm super laid back. As far as, you know, 
you know, like the transportation and everything. I take my time, but it's like hustle and bustle over there. You know what I mean? Yeah, urgency, all, all that. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's also cool, especially uh, in the music industry, or just like because it just seems like like some of the trombonists I've met and, and followed and that are New Yorkers, man, they're in several bands, like they're hustling. You know what I mean? They got to pay rent. They got to pay their bills. And so, yeah. and I think it's cool. Yeah. Because, it's crazy, bro. yeah and, and I think it's yeah. cool though, because, you know, you want to tap into not just one genre of music because, you know, and, and I feel like, like this one trombone player, uh, Nadav, uh, that I met, uh, he plays in a band called It Could Be Shakedown, and this guy is sick trombone player, and uh, he, not only does he have his own band, he's like in like, you know, a brass band, uh, he plays in a, a, a Latin salsa band, he gets uh, get, uh, gets called for like, you know, Latin gigs and stuff like that, so he can do it yeah. all. And the dog, uh, tall, tall white guy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know him, yeah. yeah. He just released a record uh, a few years ago, I think. Yeah. I remember when he, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude's sick, man. And um but yeah, and there's so many good musicians in, in New York and stuff like that. It's it's crazy. It's yeah. like but yeah, it's the like learning how to hustle and just, you know, have that drive to like, you know, I can I can make ends meet doing what I love doing, you know what I mean? At a high level. And that's cool. And so that's what you went to New York to go, you know, learn, right? Yeah. That's yeah. I mean essentially it's like if you work if you work in oil and gas, you move to Houston. You know what I'm saying? Because this is where your industry is. If you work in television, you move to LA because that's where your industry is. You know. Mm -hmm. um, if you work in like hotels or something like that, you'll move to a place like Miami or Las Vegas because yeah. that's where your industry is. You know. So like music was it's my industry, so I moved to where the industry was. Um, and like being in New York was, I mean, bro, I tell you, man, like there's there's nothing like being surrounded by a bunch of dudes that's bad as shit. Like everyone in New York is the best from wherever they come from. Yeah. And like you all in the same pot, you know, and everybody just kind of going for what they know. Yeah. And the only thing you can really cling to is what makes you an individual. You know what I'm saying? What makes you, you, yeah. you can't be like everybody else because er everyone knows all the Charlie Parker solos. If you playing saxophone. Mm -hmm. If you playing trombone, everyone knows the JJ Johnson stuff. So you can't just go and do that. Mm -hmm. You can sound cool somewhere else doing that. <laughs> yeah. But in New York, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, no, nah, it's 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 really dope though, man. Because, um, like you saying, like I never, I never really had to do anything else. I taught for like, like maybe like two years out of my like seven seven years of being in New York. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But, I mean, bro, I, I mean, I yeah, definitely made a living doing doing what I do. Like I played in a lot of different bands too. Like uh, I played when I got to New York, I was playing in Salsa Classica. I was playing with uh, Lower East Salsa. Nice. Um, yeah, they Lower East Salsa. I think they have the Grammy with Celia Cruz. Okay. Yeah. Um, or I forget what record, but like they're like serious, serious, bro. Like they're not. Man, I was. I mean, I'm just. I'm in there playing the parts. Mm -hmm. uh, no, this is with Salsa Classica. This is the Lower East Salsa practice in the big building. Salsa Classica practiced in like somebody's garage, bro. Damn. And we were like in the garage playing. And um, the guy was like, stop, stop, stop. He was like, he's like, trombone. He said, do you, do you know the parts? And I was just like, I'm reading it. I, I literally was sight reading, bro. And that's, and that's what everyone in New York, you step into a gig, bro. It's like, hey, here's the chart. It's hard as fuck. Be ready to record it in like five minutes. Damn. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you better play that mug like you know it, like you know rehearse it thirty times. Cause yeah. I was in South Alaska, I'm playing with these guys, and playing together 15, 20 years. Yeah. So I'm like, trombone, do you know the part? And I was just like, yeah, I'm reading it, bro. And he was just like, play it then. And I saw I'm playing it, and he was like, no, play it. And I was just like, oh shit, like so he wanted me to play it with the same like like intensity and like confidence that everyone else is playing. I'm like, bro, I'm sick reading this, bro. I'm like, this is great. I mean, this is too much. I thought I was going to fight the guy or something. He was just so intense, man. I was like, bro, this is too much, bro. Like, so I was, I'm just doing my best, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It made me better, though. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, definitely. Like that. And, and like the, the Revive Big Band, too, was just like that, too, man. Like, like the Revive Big Band is basically a collection of the who's who of jazz musicians mm -hmm. in the same band. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, 
I step into a revive rehearsal with my man Igmar um, Thomas, uh, who's the band leader, and like over here next to me is my man Earl, who's from Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, Ernest Travis, um, Ben Williams is on bass. Um, man, who was playing drums? This is like everyone's like uber famous. Yeah, this all in this, and bro, everyone's like, "All right, y'all ready to read these charts? All right, pop, 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 pop." <laughs> and like Frank Lacey is sitting next to me. Dang. You know what I'm saying? Like that's he's playing Frank Lacey is playing like second trombone. And then who was playing first trombone at the time? Damn, I forget, I forget his name. And my man Max uh, was playing um, bass trombone. Man, these dudes are phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. And it's like and everyone's playing forte. Like even the piano is like <laughs> loud, bro. They're like everyone is playing loud and you're gonna hear ain't no high your sound. Mm-hmm. And the next person, nah, ain't none of that, bro. Nah, you play boss to the wall. <laughs> Dang, that's awesome. So, yeah, so what bro. other groups did you get to play with while you were in New York or uh, got connected with? Ah, oh, man. Um, it took me a while to, to find my scene, really. When I first moved to New York, I was just doing production stuff because I had to make money. Yeah. So I had studio know-how, and um, I was just producing and stuff like that. But, I mean, so immediately... I started my own band. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just started working that. And then I found the Village Underground um, with Shell Pepsi and Raleigh's the first. That's the first artist I played for. And, you know, I talk about paying dues not very often, mm-hmm. but I feel like it's something that has to be talked about, though. Um, because I play, when I started playing for Cheryl, when I showed up at the, at the venue, right? First of all, this is not even a place. This like the Village Underground Black Velvet Monday is like in the R and B world. It's like here. It is the top. There, like when Art Babyface comes to town, when Prince comes to town, they go there to hear music. You know, when Stevie Wonder's in town, he goes there to listen to that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like I showed up. I just happened to show up when the main saxophone player was out. The band thought that the saxophone player sent me to sub for him, which is the only reason I played that night. <laughs> because I, I found out much later that if that had that mis, mishap had not been made, yeah, I would have been sitting around waiting and probably never had played. So I came and I did my thing, you know, and they were like, okay, cool. They let me solo, which Cheryl never lets any stranger just pick up their horn and start soloing unless... Now, when one of the, of us give them like the, they good, nice, you know. Yeah. So they let me do my thing, bro. And um, I played there. I I played there. They were like, "You gonna be up next week? You gonna come back next week?" And I was like, "Yeah." And so I'm just like, "Oh shit!" Like they invited me back. So then I, I just kept coming, bro. And I showed up to that gig every single week, early, left late, for a year Damn. before I even got paid, bro. Dang. <laughs> like I did that shit for free yeah like this is just straight hustle straight grind like you know like my man um ezra brown he was like man he's like yo because he, he's like yo i did it for five years mm-hmm. for free before i got put on you know and i was like damn so i did it for a year and i got put on um and then from there man like once you're at the village underground you're at the spot where everyone comes so i didn't really have to go out looking for gigs after that because yeah. everyone was coming to town so like Brandy would come to town and her MD, um, Brian Cockerham, he would be like, yo, um, yo, what's your name, man? You know what I'm saying? Like, I got this church gig, you know, like, let me connect you with that. And then somebody else would come and they'd be like, hey, yo, I'm connected with this. Let me put you on the studio job. And it's just, you know, from there, I just worked like anybody I came in contact with. Yeah. And, and on the real, like, here's a, a hack, a career hack. Uh, talked to me by Ezra Brown, the originator of Team Horn Section. Um, Ezra told me, Where, wherever you want to go in your career, research everyone that's already there. Mm-hmm. So, like, like I said, when I first came back to Houston, I was like, yo, I was trying to find out who the suffers were. So I was like, I'm researching, like, okay, who's that manager? Like, where are these guys playing? You know, because, like, that's what you got to do. You got to put yourself in, like, in the line. Of, of you know saying of what's going on for universe to, to, to get you into your spots you know what i mean Definitely. so like i started researching people bro and 
and just start showing up at the jam sessions that they would be at. Um, and then, so that's how I met a lot of people. I already, they didn't know, I already knew them though. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh shit, my man Mark Williams, what's up, bro? Not even, Mark didn't even probably know that I, I researched his ass and I knew that he played for the Roots, I knew that he played for this person. And I was just like, and I just happened to meet him that night. I was like, oh shit. He's like, he's like, yo, man, what's your name? I'm like, I'm Matty, man, what's your name? I know this nigga. Hey, man, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Already, bro. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, I mean, I just did that, man. And um, every single phone number, every email, like every day, I would wake up. Um, you know, I practice a little bit. I make my phone calls. I make my text messages. I make my emails. You know, yo, Tyrone from Crown Heights Affair. What's going on? Anything coming down the pipe? Mm -hmm. like, oh no, not right now. But you know, all right, cool, man. You know, I'll, I'll be in touch. You got you. You playing at a session somewhere recently, or some, some this week, or something like that? Oh yeah, I'm playing at such and such. Cool, I'm showing up. You know, hit up Mark. Yo, Mark, what's going on, man? Anything coming down the pipe? What's going on with you? What, what you got? What uh, happening this week? And he's like, oh man, you know what? I actually need a sub for this wedding band. Can you play on Saturday? Yes, sir. I sure can. You know what I mean? And so that's like. Just constantly checking on all of my relationships that I had and really like that's I mean, I didn't move to New York with friends. I moved to New York for work. Yeah. You know, so literally all my friends are my co-workers and my yeah. people that I work with in New York. Like Mark Williams, a great friend of mine now, you know what I mean? Like all the people that I mentioned are like our friends are like close to being family to me. You know, but, but I just it really just came from work though. Any, anybody I met, bro, if you introduced yourself to me, mm -hmm. I was on it. Like I didn't care. I didn't care, nor did I even know a lot of times like where these people were in the industry because you're in New York. The same people that play the fifty dollar gigs or pay the gigs for free are the same people that play the gigs in Australia and get paid a thousand dollars to do. They're the same people, you know. Like it's the same grind, the same mentality. Like when I started the Gumbo Jam in New York, my MD um, for the Gumbo Jam was my man um, Andre Pivot, who is Gregory Porter's MD now. Wow, you know. Well, my bass player uh, now plays for Charlie Poof. Um, you know, my guitar player was this guy uh, from Lake Charles, actually, was where I'm originally from. Like, he actually um, was, like, playing with a bunch of other major artists, whatever. And they did that. They did the gumbo jam for free. Wow, that's awesome. For free. Because they just, like, they knew, like, yo, this is a platform that needs to be built. We're going to build it. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the grind in, in New York. You know what I'm saying? Like, everyone's just like, yo. These dudes go out and make thousands of dollars with other people. They gonna but they gonna come together and play with me, you know, to just build some stuff up. And that's just how that's just how it is, man. Like that that sense of urgency, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's real, man. And it's like when when you really want something really bad, you'll do whatever it takes to get it. Yeah, man. It's that hustle, that grind, like yeah. that mentality, man. That's awesome. That's yeah. Great. Uh, so, so let's, uh, I want to ask you about, I guess, like, or your origin story, like, as far as, like, what, what got you playing trombone, uh, and, and music in general, did, um, do you have a lot of influence, like, from family, or is there anything that, like, inspired you to, like, do what you're doing? Um, okay, so, when I was a, a kid, like maybe like my son's like seven, eight years old. My aunt in Lake Charles had a uh, piano, and I would always just go mess around on the piano, you know. And um, I I just I I'll never forget like what it felt like the like those vibrations and hearing those vibrations of um, certain like sounds and chords. And I couldn't play piano. I had no teaching. I didn't know nothing. You know what I mean? I could. I could play two notes. I knew these notes sounded like this. I could learn chopsticks, kind of, you know, uh, yeah. pressing the buttons or whatever. And just like listening to that, like anytime I went to my aunt's house, what I did was I sat on that piano and I played it. I just spent a whole hour or two there and not even really know. Mm -hmm. And this was when I was a little kid, but it was just a toy to me. I, you know what I'm saying? I didn't think nothing of it. Um, Cause I was, you know, I was a football player and I was going to grow up and be a, 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 a football uh, coach and, just like my grandfather and all that stuff. I wasn't thinking about music like that, you know. Um, but also, you know, like if I heard a song on the radio, I I, I knew it. Like all the parts of the song, I could harmonize with it. 
you know, and this was just like things, just like little fun things that you just keep in the back seat of the car, you know. And that's I would, you know, I think about stuff now as a grown up, and I'm like, man, I, I, I didn't realize I, mean, I had a gift for that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, man, my my family's from Lake Charles, and um, so I spent a lot of time there uh, growing up. And uh, like I said, at my aunt's house, playing on her piano. And then when I got to sixth grade, the only thing in sixth grade that you could do that was a corporate school activity was band, the band and choir. Yeah. And you're not gonna be. A, I'm telling you, bro. You're not gonna. When I was coming up, choir was not a cool thing. Like I was, I was very concerned with being a cool kid. I was yeah. a football player. <laughs> I'm here friends. Like the boys that was in choir, they was not cut like me, bro. They was they was different. Yeah, yeah. You know? Like nah, uh-uh. I'm gonna <laughs> do this band thing. And uh, so I did the band. And um, me and my my like my best friend at the time was named Christine Wynn. Um, and so uh, Christine and I were like, "Yo, we're gonna play clarinet." I was like, "All right, cool, yeah, clarinet. What's what's up?" So signed up for clarinet. Uh, I think I had a babysitter that used to play clarinet, nice. and I used to play on the clarinet. So I'm like, yeah, I already know how to play it, whatever. Yeah. Uh, played on the clarinet. Uh, there was like a trumpet at my house around fifth or sixth grade too. I don't know why. I just I used to mess around on that too. Though. Um, but I ended up playing clarinet. Wanted to play clarinet. Signed up for clarinet class. First day of clarinet class. We're walking to class. I'm in the back of the line, you know, where all the cool bad kids hang out at, really. <laughs> so, I'm up with my homies. We walk into class, and, you know, they're like, okay, woodwind sit over here, low brass sit over here. So I'm walking over there, you know, confident, walking. Man, I'm about to play clarinet. I'm about to sit down first because all my friends go sit around me because I'm the man. And blah blah blah, you know. <laughs> man, I sit down. I don't sit by Christine because she's a girl, so I'm like, I'm gonna sit by my homies, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna yeah. sit by the cool kids at. I sit down, everybody go over there, start going that way, and I'm like, oh, y'all, y'all, oh, you playing that? Okay, cool, cool. And then I just look, and class is about to start, and all the boys are on this side of the classroom, all the girls and boys that. <laughs> Kind of act like girls that's yeah. doing this club, <laughs> and I was just like, I kind of did one of these, like Mr. Uh, Timpany, Tim Timpany was my teacher. Um, nice, nice I was like, and he saw me, and he was like, and I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> God bless that man. <laughs> he saw what was happening, and he was like, no, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, so I, I went over you. there. I had no idea what they were playing over there. I didn't know what they were. I I just wanted to be, you know, with, with the boys. I yeah. wanted to be over there, man. Huh? And so, you get over there, and he was like, yeah, you know, so trombones and and tubas and euphoniums. And I was just like, okay, I didn't know what that was, bro. Yeah. And uh, but I mean, it's just really funny because from day from day one, mm-hmm. like I was like the best one in class. Nice from jump dude. and it was just like a different kind of feeling because um like growing up playing football i was always like in the top like group you know what i'm saying like on the team yeah yeah um but i wasn't like the best mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying so it's different from being like you know coming between fifth and third all the time you know like you feel good like yeah i'm good you know yeah but, Nice, dude. And I just, I was like, man, I was addicted to it, bro. I was just like, dude, there's, there's no way I'm going to let anybody ever get better than me. Like, I mean, my practice records, they used to be like, hey, man, you know, um, you got to practice 30 minutes a day, you better got to sign it. Man, my practice record be like three hours. Dang. I have this day, two hours this day. I wasn't going outside to play basketball like right that. It's just great no more. Um, in the summertime, I started working on my basketball game again because I was just practicing so much, man. And um, then I would do the stuff I was doing on trombone. I'd go back and do it on trumpet because I just had one of the house and started to understand what this is. I'm like, oh, man, this is the same. And so, man, after that, bro, I was I was pretty much hooked. And it was a wrap after that, man. Like, I, 
high school, I was like, all right, well, you know, I mean, I, I went, did it, went all the, the contests, you know, I said the high school class and everything. Um, still played football, ended up quitting football for band, which was a big deal for me because football is what I've known since I was there for five years old. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because I knew I was going to do music. Well, in high school, I thought I was going to do band or I didn't know I was going to actually do a professional division. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's what happened. <laughs> how how hard was it to balance like you know practicing like football like football and, and band because i know like sometimes like you know especially like during the football games like would you would you like not uh go with the team during halftime and like do marching band with the band and stuff like that oh, okay Probably still looking sideways for that. Yeah. But I mean, it's 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 still. I mean, it, it it's what I end up doing in life. You know, ain't nobody likes me for that. Yeah, and I was gonna say you. I think you made a, the right choice. Right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, so too. Yeah. Uh, so fast forward now. Since um, you uh, you have a record out, uh, Southern Southern Comfort. Yeah. And that came out uh, for about four years ago. Uh, how how did uh, the concept of that come about? Um, conceptually, so like the con- the concept, I guess, came after the music. Mm-hmm. You know, so like really, the the music was first, and then I was like, okay, well, what am I gonna name this thing? And then I came up with the name, and then you know, talked over like the 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 visuals and stuff like that, the graphics and everything. My, yeah. my man in Tokyo. His name is Tokyo. He's from Tokyo. <laughs> nice dude. <laughs> the that, that did, yeah, the guy that did the artwork. Um, and so like that just became like the thing. And I mean, yeah, that's that's what it is. I mean, I just stayed true to who I was, man. Like I said, uh, in in New York, with everyone being so so dope, mm-hmm. really, what made me different or or special was I just I just did me. I didn't try to do nobody else. Like, like this is how I play. And I don't play like, I guess, a, a typical trombone player. Cause I didn't learn how to play from a trombone player. I learned how to play from saxophone players, from trumpet players, from guitar players. Everyone that was around me at TSU, yeah. there weren't no other you know, trombone players there mm-hmm. like that. So I just learned from them. So my approach to the instrument is a lot different than like, you know, typical trombone player, how they play lines. And I look at, people and how they play and I'm like man I wish I could like you know play like that bro because it's, it's, it's so trombone you know yeah. what I'm saying <laughs> no, I don't play like that though so I, don't, I just leaned in heavy to what I did though and um what I did was just a lot of like 
you know, real soulful, you know, singable type stuff, um, um, funk stuff, and like you know, southern roots stuff. Yeah. So that kind of became like the brand of um, like you know the music and you know, our live shows and everything like that too. So I just went with it. I just I just really try to just stay in my lane and do do me and do what I do. Like yeah. cause there's so many guys that's, man, there's so many guys that's better than me. I feel like damn near everyone that I know is damn near better than me. <laughs> like, I, oh my cool. god, I have this conversation with a lot of my friends. I'm like. Dude, like I go, I'll go, I'll go to a concert and I see a trombone player playing. And I was like, man, I'm, I want to go, I, I want to go home and practice. Like I suck. <laughs> like <laughs> every time, every time. Like my actually, one of my first students. I was 16 years old when I took this dude on as a student. Um, I was 16, 17. Um, my man Jarvis Cooper. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I know Jarvis's mom. I actually was a, a clinician at Wilson Intermediate and I, at Shotwell when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. And he was one of my first students. I remember getting Jarvis, and Jarvis is my greatest success story because when I got Jarvis, his sound was trash. He could move on the horn. Yeah. Like, like the the athletic, like, you know, coordination to get around on the horn. But his sound was terrible, bro. And, um, I mean, you know, we worked on that for some years, man. And then I hear Jarvis years later. When he was at Ike, and I was just like, oh, man, this dude sounds great. Then I went to TSU, and I think one time I walked in and Jarvis was playing. No, Jarvis went to school somewhere else. And then I came back to, to, to teach them or something like that. And I, I heard him playing the TSU band on one day. And I was like, damn, who's this trombone player in here? So I walk in, and I look, and it's him. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> and then I hear Jarvis at, Jarvis comes through to the gumbo jam sometimes. He'll be playing. I'd be like, I was like, man, what was that, bro? Like, let me let me try and get some of that. Like, what is that, man? Let me learn that. <laughs> Yo, I, I mean, I'm like, man, I feel like it's just like some. So I just feel like everyone is so so dope, man. Honestly, I don't I don't think that. Like I said, man, I, I feel like a lot of people are better than me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I just it's just like everyone does things differently. You know Definitely, what I'm saying? Definitely, yeah. And yeah, I try to tell myself that as well because like there's times where I'm just like, oh damn, like I wish I sounded like that. But then I get compliments and I'm like, I'm like, well, I must be doing something right. But I guess, you know, I, and I've said this before, it's just like, you know, and you said it too, it's like, you know, finding your voice, uh, do you, and you know, yeah. your personality comes out, you know, of the trombone and stuff like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Yo, you know, I, Andre Hayward, um, we would be on, like, I'd be on the phone with him, and he'd be like, yo, he's like, I'm like, man, what you doing? He's like, man, I'm just, like, really kicking myself over here, man, because, you know, I'm, I really don't like my sound. And I was like, my, your sound? He's like, man, I'm working on my tone. He's like, my tone just needs so much work. I said, I was like, what? Like, you've heard, <laughs> you've heard Andre Herbert play, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. He's killing Andre it. had a tone that everyone else is trying to sound like. Everyone wants to sound like that. Yeah. I'm like, what the hell? I was like, nah, man, my, my clarity is just not. I was just like, what? The fuck? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a couple of times where I'm like, like I've seen Andre play. At, there's a place, I don't know if you've heard it, Cons. It's on, in Midtown, it's a bar. And uh, and like uh, on Sundays they would have sometimes I think it was Sundays at the time I don't remember but they would have some jazz nights on Sundays and certain days, and uh, our, our uh, my friend Corey Wilson he plays sax, uh, he would lead the band and and uh, Andre came in just randomly you know just to jam, and I was like holy shit that's Andre Hayward and I was just like <laughs> in all the whole time I was like damn I want to sound like this you know, and then uh, another time I'd seen him. Uh, my uh, our percussionist uh, Choppy Luna, he was playing a, a gig uh, at Pub Fountains, uh, like off of Richmond or something, and uh, mm-hmm. our trumpet player John was playing, and Andre was on trombone, and Andre came with a P bone, and like he made that sound like a like a fucking like three thousand dollar horn, like it's just yeah, like, he's just so good that you would never you're like dude how do you make that piece of plastic sound like like one of the best horns I've ever heard. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the people actually, man, I got a people on my first time with on Con Selmer. Mm-hmm. And um, 
Bro, I cut I cut a pop record with a, with a D bar. Oh, nice, dude! Like a really, a really major pop record, and um, I had a I was. Uh oh. No. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh, you know I told you I had to put my joint on, on do not disturb. Yeah. Well, I have a phone call coming through. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. But yeah, man. Uh, yeah. The P bomb the is dope. I think it's dope. I've played several gigs with it. Um I mean there are it does have its limitations or whatever. But I mean like you can still do your thing with it. It travels light. Mm-hmm. You know so it's it's cool. But like to, to just to touch briefly back on what we were just talking about, um like so Dre was like beating on beating on himself about like his tone, right? Yeah. And Lexi, who is like a god. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Bro, Frank is like, and so he called everybody Roots. He's like, yeah, Roots. You know, I like some of that, some of that, that greasy stuff, man. You doing, man? Yeah, bro. Hey, Roots. What, what was that you just played? I'm like, well, did you just ask me what I just played, bro? Like, you're Frank Lacey, dude. Like, what the hell? You know. <laughs> It's, but it's just like you know all the guys all the greats man mm-hmm. all, all the goats bro they they have this one thing in common and they are forever students of the music like they're forever hungry yeah like they don't have no like they don't they don't come at you like yo let me show you this let me show you they be like yo man show me this like teach me this like you know that's just their attitude yeah and i just know it's like a common thing so like if you feeling you know like yo man like that dude was great but like, you're in good company bro because all of the greats feel like that about each other and about you and anybody else they listen to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, man. And and I've, I've noticed that too because like, yeah, like especially, man, like to hear Andre like say that, I was just like, okay, like I'm not the only one that feels like that. You know what I mean? Because right. sometimes, yeah. sometimes, you know, I, like I just always second guess myself and then, but you know, I, I listen to a lot of other podcasts, uh, and and to hear uh, musicians and co- uh, uh, comedians that I follow, you know, they you know they kind of feel like me as far as like you know second guessing guessing themselves. But it kind of helps. I feel like uh, teach younger kids like don't second guess yourself. You know, everybody does it, kind of thing. And you know, you're gonna find your way. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. Yeah. It's- Human is a human response to your knowing you knowing that you're not perfect. Yeah, and like you, that's a good place to be. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? That's an humble place to be. And you're always gonna get better if you stay humble like that. So yeah, definitely, man. Uh, I was gonna say. Uh, so uh, when you're, uh, what records did you record on a P bone? Because now I gotta go check that out. <laughs> and you know, don't make me a lot to you, bro. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, it was um. I remember who I was playing with. I was playing with uh. Was it Gil or my man Gil Defe was playing trumpet and was Brent on saxophone. Brent Burke may be on saxophone, but um, it was a chick from L.A. Um, man, bro. I, or or what are your uh, some uh, favorite artists that you got to work with? Uh, favorite artists. Man, definitely my time with Dave Chappelle and um, the whole Juke Joint thing, man. That was like probably one of the best times because I mean we had like different artists every time. So like you yeah. like Snoop, uh, Eric Badu, and Bush would be with this night. This night, Robert Glasper, um, Jean Baptiste, Chance the Rapper, and Estelle. Um, this night, uh, shit, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just it's just different. Mm-hmm. We like different people um, every every night, and like Dave was just mad chill, and you know I had come from, you know, an artist that was not so easy to work with, mm-hmm. but uh, it was dope experience though. You know, Miss Miss Lauren Hill, um, uh, it's, it's it's hard. That's a hard gig, bro. Like to to have, yeah. but um, you know, but it's I mean the experience you you could never I couldn't I couldn't cut that from from my life if I if I wanted to. Yeah, you know. 
Um, the people in that band, bro, is just freaking amazing. So that's awesome. I mean, I love I love that gig just because of the musicianship was like it was like a all star band, like heaven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? that's awesome. Um, I love playing for Bilal. Um, that's probably one of the coolest artists ever. Like Bilal is super cool, bro. Like I taught his, his son trombone lessons. You know what I'm saying? Like show to Bilal's house. You know, and teach his kid. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like he's just that, that kind of guy. Yeah. Um. So like, he's just real humble, down to earth. Um. Who else, man? I mean, of course, Cheryl. You know, mm -hmm. who I didn't even know was famous until years after me playing for her. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. Um. Yeah. Did, man, I, did I you get know, to do any uh, touring with any of them? Yeah, I, I toured with all, all those people on this name, too. Did, uh, like, um, like, how did you like the touring experience as far as, like, the traveling and everything? Because I know we were talking oh, about, I, I guess I know we were talking about it before we went on there about, like. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love it, man. Um, honestly, like, it was the reason I chose touring as, like, the career path I was going to take in mm -hmm. music. Um, was because, you know, for a short amount of time, I can make a lot of money. Yeah. And then I come home and I can just be that. I can just be like family. I don't have to do nothing else. Like, I don't want to leave the house if I want to. Mm -hmm. Like, my money, you know, let's, let's say like two or six weeks. We're out for six weeks. I come back home. I'm two months maybe at the house doing local stuff or doing like remote stuff and I go to fly to Vegas or fly to New York or something or you know what I mean? But yeah. right, but I'm just I'm just full on. And like that time, that quality of time I've always wanted to be be able to give my family. I never wanted to be the guy that's like stressed out from like working ten hours a day, mm -hmm. come home, you tired, you get to spend two hours with your kids max because they didn't come home from school. I never wanted that life, bro. Yeah. You know, I always wanted to be 24-7 dad is available, you know, when I'm at work, I'm at work, yeah. but when I'm, when I'm here, I'm full on present, you know. That's awesome. So, I'll, I'll do. Nice. Well, uh, Matt, I think it's about that time. And uh, I just yeah, want to, yeah, I, it's, I'm like, seriously, I, I've been like wanting to reach out to you for like the longest and uh, this podcast has definitely made, you know, made it possible. And uh, I'm really hoping that we get to, you know, sit down some more after this whole pandemic thing, whenever, whenever it's done, and we get the gumbo yeah. jam back to uh, Big Top. I would love yeah, to come yeah. by and get schooled, man. <laughs> yeah, whatever, man. Come school with us, man. Cam comes through all the time, man. Yeah, well, I, I was, I was, you know, like she she comes through, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's cool, so. man. Yeah, and then, yeah. Uh, but yeah, anytime you have a gumbo jam coming up again. Uh, uh, please tag Bone Town Podcast, and I, I'll help push that out as well, man, for sure. Okay, cool, man. Cool, I, I appreciate that, man. And it's it's good to meet you, man. And yeah, you know, it's good for uh, things to come full circle. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, definitely, man. I'm hoping to bring I, the I, whole Houston I, trombone uh, community closer. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Indeed. Yeah, Indeed. man. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate you. And then I uh, hope I'll be in touch with you, man. I hope everything's all right, and I hope you stay safe. Yeah, man. You too, man. Appreciate you. Thanks yeah. for having me, man. No problem. Later, man. All right. Peace out, bro.